be a poll in Ireland to decide who was the country's quintessential Jew, we would probably guess the result. Leopold Bloom, a fictional character. I don't think there'd be much argument about that. But here's something interesting, because when cultural critics in Israel were asked on Israel's 50th anniversary, that's exactly 20 years ago, to name the quintessential Israeli, it was another fictional character who came top. It wasn't Moshe Dayan. It wasn't Arik Sharon. It wasn't Yitzhak Rabin. It wasn't the astronaut Ilan Ramon. Israel's most representative son was Ari Ben Canaan, the <laughs> fictional protagonist of Leon Uris's novel Exodus, portrayed, of course, in the movie by Paul Newman. This was the quintessential Israeli 20 years ago. Amazing. And of course, his father was Jewish. Yes. So, published 10 years ago, sorry, published 10 years after the establishment of the state of Israel, Exodus tells the story of the rebirth of the Jewish nation in its ancient homeland. And Exodus was the first novel that described the birth of Israel from the struggles to overcome the British mandate's restrictions on Jewish immigration to the battles that followed the creation of the Jewish state. When it first came out in the USA, Exodus in 1958, Exodus became an international publishing phenomenon and the paperback alone sold more than 20 million copies. Exodus was the biggest bestseller in America since. Anyone know what it overtook in terms of mega bestsellers? Gone with, Gone with the wind. Absolutely. Very good. In 1936, and it stayed at the number one on the New York Times bestseller list for eight months. And the novel was translated into 50 languages. So, a success. A successful novel. So, what do we know about the author, Leon Uris? He was born into a Jewish family in 1924 in Baltimore, so he's American-born. His mother was a first-generation American-born, but his father was an immigrant from Poland who'd spent a year in what was then Palestine after World War I, and he changed his name to Uris. It's a derivation of the word Yerushalmi, which means man of Jerusalem. He was determined to become a writer, despite the fact that his English teachers thought that his writing ability was sub, uh, was, was absolutely crap and, and terrible. <laughs> but he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't interested and didn't listen to his teachers. And whether or not his teachers were correct is um, for readers of Exodus to decide. He dropped out of school after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and he joined the Marine, Marine Corps. And drawing on his experience in Guadalcanal and Tarawa, he wrote the best-selling novel Battle Cry, which depicted the toughness and courage of US Marines in the Pacific. He also co-wrote the script for the best, um, for, for, for a very famous movie of the same name um, for Hollywood. His next novel, was set in wartime Greece called The Angry Hills, and I've never met anybody who read it. Uris claimed that his motivation to write Exodus was to answer the question that kept emerging as he conducted his research. Why must we Jews fight for the right to live over and over each time the sun rises? His research for Exodus involved 12,000 miles of travel within Israel, and he interviewed well over 1,000 individuals. Within two years of Exodus becoming a bestseller, Otto Preminger directed and produced the smash hit movie of the same name. Preminger openly challenged the Hollywood blacklist by hiring a scriptwriter called Dalton Trumbo, who had been blacklisted for over a decade for being a communist. Composer Ernest Gold wrote an Oscar for the best original film score. And the singer Pat Boone 
wrote lyrics for the theme song, which many of you will remember. This land is mine. God gave this land to me. The, the, the music alone was number one in the hit parade. Very weird, basically. So, reading Exodus as a teenager growing up in Britain in 1960, I was transformed. Exodus changed my perceptions of Israel. It changed my perceptions of Zionism. It changed my knowledge of the Holocaust. It changed my opinion of British foreign policy. And it changed my own sense of identity. One contemporary compared the impact of Exodus on my generation of British Jews to the lettering inside a stick of rock. That is how ingrained it was in us. And this, I only got this comment last week from a friend in London um, who I mentioned that I was uh, doing this talk, and she said, well, that's what it felt like for me, the lettering inside the rock. So, for me, first and foremost, Exodus brought home the extent of my ignorance about the Holocaust. Now, even though my paternal grandparents and dozens of other family members had been murdered by the Nazi killing machine in Poland, the Holocaust was not a topic that was systematically discussed either at home or in my Jewish school growing up. I wasn't alone in not knowing much about the Holocaust. In the 50s and 60s, the Holocaust was not yet mainstream. I caught snatches of information about Hitler and the Nazis, of course, but the only thing I was really familiar with was Kristallnacht, the night of the broken uh, crystal, that my father had personally witnessed in November 1938, and the kinder transport program which brought my father to safety from Berlin to Britain in 1939. I had only a very hazy understanding of concentration camps and death camps, and before I read Exodus, I don't even think I'd ever heard of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Exodus showed me how lamentable was my knowledge of Zionist history. When my father was my age, when he was 15, as a schoolboy in Nazi Berlin, he could already quote chunks of speeches by Zionist leaders in the original Hebrew. I didn't know the details of the first Zionist Congress. And I knew precious little about the return of the Jews to their original ho homeland, and I didn't even know about the Balfour Declaration. I was especially gripped by Ulysses' dramatic retelling of the famous 29th of November 1947 partition vote in the United Nations General Assembly, which recommended the creation of two states, a Jewish state and an Arab state, and which led six months later to the um, announcement of Israel's independence in May 1948. When I finished reading the book, I angrily confronted my refugee parents who had arrived in Britain, both of them, just before World War II. How could you continue to vote Labour knowing how the Attlee government and its odious anti-Semitic foreign minister Bevin fought so hard to prevent Jewish refugees reaching mandatory Palestine. I, I could not, for the life of me, understand why they were Labour supporters. And I only recently learned that Chaim Weizmann, later Israel's first president, sort of preempted my accusatory question, because he writes in his, uh, in his autobiography, if ever a political party had gone unequivocally on the record with regard to a problem, it was the British Labour Party with regard to the Jewish National Home. But within three months of taking office, the British Labour government repudiated the pledge so often and clearly and vehemently repeated to the Jewish people. I suppose I would have been even harsher in my accusations against my parents had I known that at the same time that Britain was preventing the Holocaust survivors on board the Exodus 1947, that's the name of the ship around which the novel and the, and the movie were built, a real ship that brought real refugees 
uh, to um, try to uh, bring them to, uh, to Israel, what was then still um, Palestine, and the people on board were sent back by the British in ships back to Germany. Absolute stain on British history. But had I known that at the same time that Britain was sending back these Jewish refugees to, to Germany, the Attlee government was welcoming over 200,000 Poles, Latvians, Lithuanians, Estonians, and Ukrainians, not Jewish, of course, into Britain to remedy a shortage of labor. And among the newcomers welcomed to Britain were eight thousand members of a Ukrainian Waffen SS division who had the blood on their hands of thousands of Jews they had murdered in the Holocaust. At the same time as millions of people were rushing to buy and read Exodus, the novel and its author, Leo Uris, were being savaged by most literary critics. The New York Times sniffily declared that Uris took 130,000 words to display his incompetence. In his obituary for Uris in 2003, Stephen Whitfield wrote in the Jewish Quarterly Review that Uris was not the sort of writer who stirred the admiration of literary critics and Jewish scholarship has paid very little attention to his work. Many people accused Uris of sanitizing the history of the founding of the State of Israel in order to flatter the fantasies and prejudices of American Jews. In terms of historical veracity, Uris has been criticized for simply rehashing the Ben Gurion Mapai version of the history of the Jews of Palestine and of the creation of the State of Israel. I don't necessarily disagree that Uris' narrative excludes all other versions of history. Because while researching my own book about Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson, many of you here will have heard me talk about him, and the other five British officers who helped create a military Zionism as a counterpoint to political Zionism, I too noticed Uris' left-wing bias. When I thought back to what I'd read, I realized that I had been reading a very biased version. My research revealed that Uris effectively airbrushed Vladimir Zeev Jabotinsky and his right-wing revisionists out of the Zionist narrative. In 2011, Ira Nadel wrote an unflattering biography called Leon Uris, Life of a Bestseller. He compared the author of Exodus unfavorably to some of the giants of 20th century American Jewish literature, Saul Bellow, Isaac Bashevis Singer, Bernard Malamud, and of course, Philip Roth, who died last week, and others. I was amused to discover that Uris himself held no truck with these contemporary American Jewish writers. He once said, there is a whole school of American Jewish writers who spend their time damning their fathers, hating their mothers, wringing their hands, and wondering why they were born. This isn't art or literature, it's psychiatry. These writers are professional apologists. Every year you find one, on their work, one of their works on the bestseller list. Their work is obnoxious and makes me sick to my stomach. So he gave us as, as much as, he, as well as he got. I wrote Exodus because I was just sick of apologizing or feeling that it was necessary to apologize. Saul Bellow grudgingly conceded that while some reviewers felt that Exodus was not of a high literary caliber, it was nonetheless effective as a document. Bellow said, we need such documents now. In his biography of Uris, Nadell writes that not only was Uris a mediocre writer, he was a troubled person, and that in his private life, masculine toughness was a way of concealing insecurity and confusion. One reviewer of Nadell's book wrote, 
After hearing about Ulysses' rages, bullying, grandiosity, and infidelity, it's no surprise to learn that his first marriage ended in divorce, his second wife committed suicide just months after their wedding, his third wife, who was at the same age as his grown children, also left him in the end. I have a friend in London who used to work closely with Uris, and he confirms that Uris was not a particularly nice person and had a very prickly personality. Just before we started the, this afternoon, um, Kevin um, said that he had once met um, a Uris when he was doing his research for Trinity and had come to a very similar conclusion. He ain't a very nice <coughs> man. The question I wish to pose today is, so what? What does it matter if Uris was a flawed individual? What does it matter that Exodus was ignored by literary prize committees? What does it matter if his chunky writing style produced some wooden characters? What does it matter if Uris portrayed Israel as a country populated exclusively by healthy, strong, lusty young men and women? Because even when I first read Exodus, I already knew too many Israelis in person that did not fit that <laughs> Now, I am no fan of the, Palest the late Palestinian-American scholar uh, Edward Said. But he probably got it right when he complained that Uris's demonization of Arabs became the narrative model in, Ameri in American thinking. But my point is that these criticisms leveled against Uris and his best-selling novel totally miss the point. Why? Because the true significance of Exodus never lay in its literary merit or lack thereof. The true significance of Exodus never lay in its historical veracity or lack thereof. The true significance of Exodus has precious little to do with its stereotyping of Jews and Arabs. In the New York Times, Peter Hamill described Uris's writing style thus. It is a simple thing to point out that Uris writes crudely, that his dialogue can be wooden, that his structure occasionally groans under the excess baggage of exposition and information. Simple, but irrelevant, he says. None of that matters as you are swept along in the narrative. And the whole point about Exodus's not true significance lies in its mega impact on generations of Jews and non-Jews as well. His ability to use his storytelling skills to describe the birth of the Jewish state hugely impacted on millions of readers. I can name dozens of my own friends who still claim that reading Exodus directly inspired their decision to move to Israel to make Aliyah. Here in Ireland, Ellen Battersby of the Irish Times described Uris' ability to cast an emotive, bombastic spell on readers. And I know several non-Jewish Irish people who volunteered to work on kibbutzim in Israel in the 60s and 70s as a direct result of reading the novel Exodus. Now, if Exodus made an impact in Britain and Ireland, it made a far greater and, dare I say, far more significant impact on American Jews. Because in the first 10 years since the creation of the State of Israel, most American Jews had maintained a cool, uneasy relationship with the Jewish state. According to historian Matthew Silver, something fundamental changed among American Jews as a result of the book they all became ardent Zionists. It was nearly as common to find a copy of Exodus in American Jewish households as it was to find the Bible, and of the two, not a few Jewish households only had Exodus. Exodus, writes Silver, had an incalculable effect 
on the way American Jews thought about Israel and Jewish history. In an American Jewish world that was just emerging from high levels of anti-Semitism and discrimination, Exodus empowered Jews and informed the consciousness of a generation of American Jews of Israel. Exodus also helped enlist support for Israel among American political leaders and the American public at large, an alliance that has continued despite periodic tensions to this day. The impact of Exodus on British Jews, some European Jews and American Jews is relatively well documented. Less known is the powerful impact of Exodus <coughs> on a very different major Jewish community, the Jews of the Soviet Union. Let me take you back to the 60s. Before the mass aliyah of Jews from the former Soviet Union. My communal rabbi in England, rabbi, the late Rabbi Asher Feuchtwanger, made a prediction to me that at the time sounded fantastical. In our lifetime, he said to me, I have no doubt that we will see the mass aliyah of Soviet Jews. But this miracle will bring in its wake a huge problem. How will Israel cope with hundreds of thousands of youngsters whose communist and atheist education will have left them bereft of Jewish and Zionist education? This was his question to me. This was what occupied this lovely rabbi in the 1960s. And at the time, the notion of a mass immigration from the hermetically sealed Soviet Union of Jews seemed downright ludicrous. I really thought that my lovely rabbi and mentor was totally out of touch with reality. And I, I just have to put this into a little bit of context. I visit Israel frequently, and I have family there, including a very precocious 14-year-old grandson who said to me at Pesach Saba, he said, do you know that Israel's Eurovision song is trending way above anybody else's on social media? And I said, you, you poor, stupid, ignorant <laughs> child. <laughs> there is no way that an Israeli song in this climate in these days could possibly get anywhere close to number one. I happen to be in Australia watching live on the morning, <laughs> like the Sunday morning, when, and the first thing I did was I texted my grandson and I said, your granddad is an old fogey, don't pay any attention. <laughs> and, and that's how out of touch I felt this elderly rabbi was in the 1960s. And of course, the one who was out of touch was me. His grasp of Jewish and world history was much more sophisticated than mine. He could already sense the cracks in the Soviet facade that would eventually bring about the demise of the whole communist system. So for my rabbi, it wasn't the question of if they come, it was a question of when they come, and this is what occupied him. When they come, they will be ignorant. And for my research, Exodus, that terribly written novel, delivered the most potent response to the rabbi's question about the ignorance of Soviet Jewry. Now, it is a, almost a cliche today to say that the Six Day War created huge pride among the, the Jews of the Soviet Union, and this is true. But the Zionism of Soviet Jewry did not start in 1967. Israel's victory did unleash a surge of Jewish pride in the Soviet Union, but the first real seeds of the wish for Jews to leave the Soviet Union for Israel came when they read Exodus. Precisely how the first copy of the novel found its way 
into the Soviet Union is a matter of urban myth. According to one story, the Israeli consulate in Leningrad received copies in the diplomatic mailbag and started handing them out to the Soviet Jews. Exodus soon achieved the status of a sacred text among refuseniks in the 1960s and 1970s. Samizdat translators spent months producing a Russian version of the novel and then painstakingly typed out copies that were passed from hand to hand. Refusenik Leonid Feldman recalls the danger and secrecy that surrounded the book no one ever called Exodus by its name. I quote from him. I waited one night at 11 in a dark corner of a park. I was handed a heavy briefcase. Take a taxi and go home, said the courier, but you must return with your manuscript to this spot by 7 a.m. in the morning. Finished or not, no one must know what you have done. In 1985, Yaakov Levin, a Hebrew teacher, this is 1985, right? This is only a few years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yaakov Levin, a Hebrew teacher in Odessa, was sentenced to three years imprisonment for alleged anti-Soviet activities, which included circulating exodus. The same year, Leonid Volvovsky was convicted of slander and sentenced to three years in Soviet prison. One of the charges against <coughs> the Jewish computer expert was that he distributed anti-Soviet propaganda. And of course, we're talking about exodus. According to historian Leonard Schroeter, the enormous significance of exodus to the growth and stimulation of the Jewish movement in the Soviet Union can hardly be overstated. According to Jerry Goodman, executive director of the National Conference on Soviet Jewry, most of the Soviet Jewish activists in the late 60s and early 70s always cited the importance of the book. They didn't treat exodus as a literary experience, it was the only knowledge they had of the Jewish experience. Israel's first Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, said about the novel, as a literary work, it isn't much, but as a piece of propaganda, it's the best thing ever written about Israel. I want to turn for a few moments to the way in which some of Israel's enemies have distorted Ben-Gurion's comment. We need to ask, is it true that someone deliberately set out to commission Exodus in the service of Israeli propaganda? Was this like some sort of covert government policy? British writer Robert Fisk has a well-earned reputation as one of the world's most odious and obsessive Israel bashers. Maybe that's why he is invited so regularly by radio stalwarts such as Pat Kenny. It, in an unintended tribute to Ben-Gurion, Fisk described Exodus as a racist fictional account of the birth of Israel and was one of the best pieces of socialist Zionist propaganda that Israel could have sought. But when Fisk used the word propaganda, of course, he meant it in a sinister way. He based his contention that Exodus was a deliberate propaganda tool on Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said Professor of Arab Studies at Columbia University, who told an audience at the Palestine Center in New York in 2011, not 2000, not, not 1960 or 1970, seven years ago. Exodus was not the unaided fruit of the intellectual loins of Leon Uris. He wrote it, of course, said Khalidi, but the book was commissioned by a renowned public relations professional, a man who was in fact considered by many to be the founder of public relations in the United States. Edward Gottlieb desired to improve Israel's image and chose Uris to write the novel after his successful first novel on World War II. Gottlieb secured the funding which paid for Uris's research and trip to Israel. Gottlieb's inspiration to send Leon Uris to Israel may have constituted one of the greatest 
advertising triumphs of the 20th century. And the trouble with Khalidi is that he is a fake historian peddling fake news, which probably explains why Fisk so loves him. The Gottlieb Commission, it's a myth, it never happened. Uris's biographers, all of them dismiss it. No documents in Uris's papers or Israeli archives testify to its existence. And as for Gottlieb himself, no one's ever heard of him. He was a minor character in the history of the American PR industry. And the truth is that the idea of Exodus as a novel about the birth of Israel originated with Uris himself. After his success with Battle Cry, his agent Malcolm Stewart suggested that Urish should sell his idea for Exodus to Hollywood studios and New York publishing houses. He was probably one of the first people in Hollywood who got a movie deal before he even wrote the novel. So he was very powerful in his uh, powers of uh, persuasion. The truth is, Oh yeah, I said that. Um, his trip in 1956 was financed by advances on the film rights for the book rights. So he was a smart, you know, he, he knew how to, uh, to raise money. And yet this fake Gottlieb commission persists in the echo chamber of anti-Israel literature where it is repeated again and again, and as I said, as recently as 2011. Because if you be believe in Zionist mind control, you must always assume the existence of a secret mover, of a Zionist conspiracy. To sum up, Uris himself described Exodus as his greatest accomplishment saying that the novel changed people's lives, changed the conception of the Jewish people in the international scene. And explaining why he thought that his novel received such an enthusiastic reception, Uri said, Exodus is the story of the greatest miracle of our times, an event unparalleled in the history of mankind, the rebirth of a nation which had been dispersed 2,000 years earlier. Exodus, he said, tells the story of the Jews coming back after centuries of abuse, indignities, torture, and murder to carve an oasis in the sand with guts and with blood. Exodus is about fighting people, people who do not apologize either for being born Jews or the right to live in human dignity. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think it is possible for me to overstate the impact that Exodus had on me, on my generation, and on subsequent generations. When he died in 2003, American novelist Jack Engelhardt, author of Indecent Proposal and other bestsellers, wrote a column headlined, The Obituary Uris Never God. And he wrote, Uris deserved better. The obits were a disgrace. They read more like a spiteful book review rather than an appreciation for the man who gave us the romance of Israel. But let's not be fooled, he wrote, for these obits were an attack upon the Jewish state, not on Uris, who merely served as a prop and a decoy. My friends, allow me to finish on a personal note. By opening my eyes to perfidious Albion, you always help me shed any last vestige of loyalty to Britain. Unfortunately, we are currently witnessing a loud echo of the lengths the post-war Labour government went to prevent Holocaust survivors from reaching Palestine between 1945 and 1948. And I refer, of course, to Jeremy Corbyn's openly anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist British Labour Party. Now, if I was very wealthy, if I had funds to spare, I would invest in Israeli real estate. Because if Theresa May's government falls, 
and there is a general election, we are likely to see the most anti-Semitic Prime Minister in Britain in living memory. Because if Corbyn becomes Prime Minister, thousands of British Jews will leave for Israel. And they're going to need apartments. Unfortunately, I don't have the money to invest because I could make a killing. I want to pay tribute to Leon Uris, that terrible writer. He turned me into a full-fledged, lifelong Zionist. I owe my later career as a writer and speaker on Zionism, the Holocaust, and Jewish history to reading Exodus all those years ago. So, Leon Uris, I thank you. <laughs>